if you're shooting log or if you're shooting raw particularly you've got more dynamic range in the camera than any current display will show aliasing and moire so you've got these holes so you get staircases you get aliasing so what do you do you put an optical low pass filter in to take the edge off it sorry you get these really sharp cameras and you diffuse the hell out of them because that's all an old olpf is doing now there's one manufacturer that doesn't use one and if you test the cameras they always come out badly with aliasing a recent HBO test showed a guy in a herringbone suit went berserk. But I've been shooting with one for three months now, testing. And under any circumstance I shoot, rather than other than square onto a brick wall, I've never had a problem. I can cause a problem if I want. I was talking to them about it the other day. They said, well, you know, tell me something that will go badly wrong. I went, oh, it's easy, garden furniture, the stuff with the holes drilled in it. If I want to make the camera a -list, I just point it at that. It'll go ape shit. But, you know, how often do you do that? If you use it on normal scenes, not really a problem. But then again, I diffuse the camera all the time. So, you know, I yeah. go for soft images. Better maths, basically. Better low-pass filters, optimised low-pass filter, and better maths. That's it. Mm. But, of course, that's one of the things that in... Because if you're shooting raw, the processing in a software is better than you'll get in camera because you can apply much heavier processing to it. The issue we have in motion pictures as opposed to stills, in stills you can choose the way something is debared. You can choose to optimise it for different subjects. And we don't have that facility yet in motion pictures. I would love to choose to debear these images like these ones, will debear them for optimised for an ageing face, make an old bloke look better. You can do that in debayering, but you know, better for a scenic, better for... We don't have that yet. Okay. If you're shooting log, or if you're shooting raw particularly, you've got more dynamic range in the camera than any current display will show. With, you know, not really high-end cameras, just mid-range cameras now. And so all you need to do is stop panicking. Um, get the exposure roughly in the middle, and you can deal with it in post later. But the whole thing with dynamic range is being able to visualise it as it will look on its final display media. So if you're going to display it on something that's only got a five-stop dynamic range, you have to bear that in mind when you're shooting it. Yes, you can control it to a degree with power windows, but you need to control your lighting to handle that, which is why it's, I find it really important to put a lookup table in the monitors on set when we're shooting. Because my last film, we had the gre agreed lookup table that we were going to use for post. We'd done tests, and that went into all the monitors. We used a Teradec to transmit it, but one of the ones that will store a LUT in. So all the monitors showed the LUTed image. And I, yeah, I plead guilty. I use the monitors for lighting quite often because I could see it was a fairly contrasty setting and I could look at it and go, yeah, I don't need to worry about that. It's going to go black and just forget it completely. Or I need to hold that highlight. I've got to do something about it because I'm going to lose it in this contrast setting. And I can do that with a spot meter. I'm actually quite more comfortable using a spot meter, establishing in the dynamic range we're going to go to What's my peak? What's my dark? Right, that's it. I've got to work. And I use the Ansel Adams zone system where mid gray is five. Caucasian skin tone, that side of my face. The lit side is six. This lighting, that side's probably three and a half. That's it. Done. I know where I am. If I keep that balance running and I know that depending on what display, that my highlight's going to clip at nine. So I try and keep those within nine. I know that I'm going to lose everything below one. So I make sure any shadows I want to have lift up. And that's it, just done. Don't need a waveform, don't need a monitor. I just need my eyes and a spot meter. And I think that's really important that people aren't really taught, don't learn to use them now. 
And one of the things I learned to do very early on was I learned to squint because it's a really good way of judging contrast. And, you know, check with a spot meter and then squint. Yeah, that looks right. You know, that's how you do it. And, you know, I was really lucky to, to operate for some amazing DPs early on in my career. And I learned a huge amount from them, just watching them. When you're shooting HDR, you cannot see. I mean, this is whole thing that was driving me mad at NAB. People were talking about HDR and how you get so much more in the shadows and highlight. Yes, you get more in the highlights. In the shadows? No, you don't. HDR in that area is a con. The only people who will see HDR in the shadows are people who are sitting in a brightness controlled grading suite. That's it. As soon as you get home, the light that bounces off your walls will bring up the black level to a point where you don't see any extra black. So you close the blinds. There's still enough, the light coming off the bright areas of the TV bounces back and screws your shadows. Right, I'll have a black wall. Still doesn't help. Face. The light bouncing off your face will lift the blacks up enough. So to get full HDR at home, you've got to paint your windows black, paint your walls black, and watch television in a burqa. Thank you.